Hi, this is Dr. Rick Janelle, and I want to talk to you today about God will go with you if you obey. Um, for many people, the idea of God being with them, God helping them, God doing things for them, is uh, it's either something that they don't believe that really happens, or they think that they can do as they wish and force God to do what they want. And the truth is somewhere in between those two. Um, if you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, God's Holy Spirit does go with you. Uh, even if we take God's Spirit places and do things with our bodies that um, God's not happy with, there is a sense in which God's Spirit is drug along and we're, we can grieve the Holy Spirit in those ways. But what I'm talking about today is more of the idea of God going with us willingly, with His... Uh, eagerness to help us, with being a partner in our, our good times and our bad times, helping us when the things are not uh, going good for us. Um, God will go with us. But to go with us in that more extreme way, we have to obey. This story from the Judges in Judges chapter 4 talks about a time when there were 20 years of suffering caused by a king by the name of Jabin and General Sisera, who brought a huge, mighty army to oppress God's people. One of the interesting things about the stories and the judges is that um, we find that sometimes God is actually behind our suffering. And this is one of those cases where God was behind it all. He, uh, he caused King Jabin to do some things that caused his own people of Israel trouble. Um, he stirred up General Sisera. And the general was a good general in that he was good at taking his military might and oppressing other people with it, and God used these people. And for about a 20-year period, none of Israel's children had known freedom. None of them had known prosperity. Um, pain and hardship was a daily way of life. And then something happened. Something changed one special day. In utter desperation, Israel decided to pray. See, today, many people who serve God imagine only one format for dealing with their problems. They think that there's a human need, the human asks God for help, and that God automatically does what we ask him to do the way we ask him to do it. And people who give it some serious thought and try to make a, a Bible uh, verse support what they're saying will often, often quote Luke one thirty seven: nothing is impossible with God. And that is true. Jesus said it is nothing that is impossible with God. And yet many times people take that verse and they stretch it and they make it apply to something that God never intended for it to apply to. Nothing is impossible with God. And yet there are things that God in his sovereignty refuses to do. Uh, he won't lie. Uh, in fact, the Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. So which is it? Is it impossible for God to lie or is it possible for God to do anything? Well, it is possible for God to do anything. But God, being who he is, gives his word, and since he doesn't lie like humans do, it's now impossible for him to lie because he said he wouldn't lie. And there's some other things that are like that in scriptures. Um, I, once had a, a, I once had a college professor who, asked, who was an atheist, and he asked the question, can your God create a rock that's too heavy for him to pick up? And no matter how you, had, how you answered that question, he would smirk and say, see, he's not really God. See, if, he, if you said, well, of course God can create a rock he can't pick up. Well, now he can't pick up the rock, right? If you said, well, no, he can't. Well, then God can't do anything, can he? See, it's a, it's a foolish and it's an unlearned question. And this is a foolish and unlearned application of this verse where it says God can do anything. Yes, God can do anything. But just because we want it that way and because we demand it be that way doesn't mean that that's what God's going to do. God says, I will go with you. He says, I will help you. But see, God is a breakthrough kind of a God. Uh, God's help and his answers come in all different kinds of ways and all different kinds of packages. And sometimes the best things that will ever happen to you are at the time one of the most painful things that could possibly happen to you. That's how great and powerful our God is. And sometimes we in our short-sightedness say, well, God, if you, don't, if you don't do what I'm asking you to do, I won't serve you. And God sadly shakes his head and says, okay, have it your way. Um, sometimes he does simply take care of things for us. Sometimes we ask God to fix a problem and the problem gets fixed. 
Sometimes we go to God with a problem and he fixes it. But there are other times, and in fact, most times, his ways are a lot more complicated than that, and a lot more involved than that. You see in this story with, uh, with the judges, with King Javid and General Sisera, when they prayed to God, God could have killed the enemy army in their camp. He did that a time or two. It only took, in one time, it only took a single angel to wipe out a huge invading army. God could have done that. God can do anything. But in this case, God didn't do that. In this case, God called his people into a cooperative effort with him, which is much more like what we find today in being uh, Christians inside the family of God through the work of Jesus Christ at the cross. See, here was God's plan for meeting their need. Their plan was, we'll pray to God and he'll fix it. Here was God's plan. He sent a judge by the name of Deborah to a man named Barak. We find this in Judges 4, verses 6 and 7. Here was God's plan. He said to Barak, you go with 10,000 men. You lead the way to Mount Tabor. I, God, will lure the army into the Kishon River, and I will give him into your hands. See how God's plan was much different than maybe what they'd been praying for? It could be that in your life today, you're praying for certain things. It could be the things at times in your life that uh, things are not what you want them to be, and, and you're sad, and you're afraid, and you're lonely, and you, you cry out to God, and you say, God, please fix this for me. Please help me with this. And yet God may be saying to you, there's some things you need to do. There's some things I'll do. We'll fix this problem together. Well, Barak he didn't have a response like Abraham or Moses. He didn't, uh, he didn't just say, okay, God, we'll do it your way. He uh, bargained and argued with God. And he said that he wouldn't go unless Deborah led him. That's Judges chapter 4, verse 8. You need to understand how unusual that was for that time, for a, a man to swallow his pride and say, I can't do this without a woman's help. Uh, it says something about his trust in God. It says something about his trust in himself the fact that he wouldn't do what God told him to do, he wouldn't believe in God's promises unless this woman, Deborah, went along with him to hold his hand. And even at that, according to verse 14, uh, he waited until Deborah told him a second time to go. This is not looking very promising, is it? Here's somebody asking God to do something. Here's a group of people asking God to do something. God's saying, this is the way I'll do it. And they're saying, well, let's make a deal. Can I get it can I get a better deal on my behalf? Can I do less and have God do more? And God does bargain with them to an extent. He does send Deborah along. He does offer help in new ways. He is patient with the guy who is very reluctant and has to be told twice. But you see, it's important to remember here that while all this is going on, verse 14 tells us that God had already given, past tense, he had already given them success. What do you mean he'd already given them success? The army is still there. They're still being oppressed. Their problem is still squarely on their heads. God had given them success. That's what the verse says. There may be things in your life right now where God has given you success, but God has, has tied some strings or has put maybe some prerequisites on your getting what he has promised you. See, God had given them success, but Barak and 10,000 people still had to go and do what God told them to do. See, God made a promise and God gave a blessing, but that promise and blessing, they were both conditional. They were dependent on people's obedience. What if the people didn't choose to be obedient? What if they didn't do what God told them to do? Would God still give them what he had already given them? I believe it's fairly obvious that the answer is no. And so we find in chapter four, verse 15, at Barak's advance, when Barak finally started to be obedient, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and the army by the sword. So let's look at this verse just a little bit more. At Barak's advance, that is, at his obedience, God routed Sisera and all his chariots and his army by the sword. So Barak obeyed, and God did the heavy lifting, but he did the heavy lifting how? With a snap of his fingers? With a blink of his eye? No. Did he send angelic armies to wipe out this army? No. God did the heavy lifting through the swords of the 10,000 people that Barak advanced with. Now see, this is probably not what they had in mind when they asked God for help. 
they probably didn't want to do it this way, and God said, no, this is the way we're going to do it, or you can choose not to, to, to have the relief at all. And so the question comes, how does this story apply to us? See, God will give us victory too. He will help us with our problems. He will solve all kinds of difficulties and, and, and hard things for us in our lives. But what do we have to do? Well, first we have to call out to him. We have to pray to him. Why does God wait for us to pray? I don't know. Does God need to wait for us to pray? No. Can God not act if we don't say the right words and have this magic incantation? No. There is nothing too great for God to do. And yet he chooses in his sovereignty to say, I will do this with you. I will do things for you, but you have to do your part. And as long as you do your part, I'll do the heavy lifting, God says. But if you don't do your part, then we'll just see how you like the way that works out. Another thing we learn from this story in Judges chapter 5, verse 16, that there were some people who missed out on this time of greatness. Um, this was a great time. God did some powerful things. Some people were involved with God doing some incredible things that are still talked about today thousands of years later. And yet while all this greatness was going on, while all this activity was being done, while God was powerfully moving on their behalf, there were some people, the Bible said, who drew back among the campfires with much, quote, searching of heart instead of joining in the battle. See, that's part of the problem we have today in our families and in our churches. There are many people who have been called by God, who have been blessed by God, who God has a storehouse full of blessing for them. And instead of getting out of their chairs, getting up on their feet and going to work, instead of praying to God and doing the best they can, they draw back and they search their hearts. I know a sociology professor one time that referred to the phrase navel gazing. He said, there are people who spend so much time gazing at their own navels that they never put into practice the things they learn when they get their education in college. I've known some people that were like that. I've known some Christians that were like that, who spend more time navel-gazing and pull, uh, mulling over the things that, that, uh, that they've learned in the Bible or learned from life, and they never get around to actually doing anything with it. They, they want to learn more. They want to learn more. They want to learn more. That's a good thing. But at some point, you've got to stop learning, and you've got to get up and go to work. We talked last Wednesday night about the need sometimes in Scripture for God when God says, why are you still talking to me about this? Get up and go to work. Uh, get up and do something. You know what I've said. You know what you need to do. What are you waiting for? That's what some of these people did. And they missed out on this greatness. And they were never able to say, yeah, I was there. Or, yeah, I saw that. Why? Because they either weren't involved in the prayers or they weren't involved in the going to work. And so they just sat back and said, you know, I think I'll just watch and see how this works out. People that do those things, people that are afraid, that hold back, that don't fully commit to God and to his ways and to his word, they find themselves missing out on some of the greatest things in life. And according to James, Judges 5.23, they didn't just miss out on some great things. God rebuked them with a curse. It frightens me to think about people that I know who could possibly be living under a curse because they either don't pray or they don't study their Bibles or they're unwilling to get up and go to work and do what God has told them to do. And the good slash bad thing about this verse is there's no other place in the Bible where angels use such harsh language to talk to and about people. And there's some really evil people in scriptures that have been rebuked by God and rebuked by angels and rebuked by his ministers who were human ministers at times. And yet out of all those horrible, horrible, nasty, terrible things, this time stands a head and shoulders above the others where there's an angel with a message from God with a curse on people. You see, God was deeply angry with those who sat back while others took risks, while others did the work. If you're one of those people who sits back and doesn't do your share of the work, whether it's in your family or in your neighborhood or in your job or in your church, if you sit back and you're constantly thinking, what about this? What about that? How come it's not my way? Why isn't it my turn? I want to do it this way. Why won't they do what I want them to do? It could very well be that many of the things you're suffering with in your life right now are because God is trying to get your attention. 
You see, God doesn't like for his people to be like this. God doesn't approve for his family to be this way. Oh, God can do anything. Yes, he can do anything, but he has said, I will not condone this kind of behavior in my family and among my children. In the hall upstairs in my house, there's a little table with a lamp on it, and there's a little plaque on it that says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. For some people, I hope that's a warning. For some people, like my children, I hope that's a promise. But regardless, for me and my household, there are some things we are going to do, and there's some things that we're not going to do. And I can't tell you what to do. I can't tell my grown children what to do in their households either. But I can tell you this, in my household, when you're dealing with me, there are some things we are not going to do, and there's some things that we will do. Couldn't I do things differently? Yes. But I refuse. Why? Because I am the way that I am. I am who I am. And there's some things that I've taken a stand about. God does the same thing in his family. And if you're one of those people who choose to take a different stand, if you're one of those people who refuse to change your stand to match his stand, then you're a person that's living in rebellion. And this is not a good thing. See, in this case, these people's great sin was not what they did. The great sin that made God so angry was what they didn't do. Uh, Sometimes in in Bible study, talk about what sin is. Well, sin sometimes are things that you do. And there are other times there are things that are sins that you didn't do. There are sins of omission and sins of commission. And in this case, these were sins of omission. So in conclusion today, I want you to think about this. Don't be afraid to pray and ask God for great things. Asking him for less than great things dishonors him, his greatness and his power. Why? Because there's nothing too difficult for God. There's no problem in your life that God can't help you with. And when he takes care of things for you, however that looks and however long it takes for you to to, to recognize that your problem has been dealt with, remember to say thank you. Remember that many of God's greatest blessings come from working together with him and with his people and toward accomplishing God's plans and purposes. When you became a Christian, you entered into a legal deal. You came into a legal contract. God said, I will buy you back. I will redeem you. I will forgive your sins. I will make you part of my family. I will give you resurrection from the dead. Now, what's your deal? What's your part of this deal? Your part of this deal is that you must be a productive part of God's family. And you are agreeing that you will agree with God when he says what he wants. Anytime you're a Christian and you say, I know what God wants, but I want this. Why won't he do it my way? Why isn't it my turn? What you're doing is you're saying, God, I want to take your throne. It's almost as if you're dragging God's arm and pulling him off of his throne and saying, I want to sit here for a while. You do what I tell you to do. Listen, that's trouble. Uh, When my children were young and we deal with my, my young grandchildren, I'm not quick to spank them. I'm not quick to get angry. But if they get too big for their britches or they get too rebellious, they get too demanding, and if they get too handsy with me, The whole world stops. The candy goes away. The toys go away. The good times go away. What they want go away. And it's a very, very, very serious thing between me and them. And until that gets settled, nothing else happens. What they want doesn't get done. The toys they want to play with don't get played with. The candy they wanted, they don't get any of it. Why? Papa can do anything. You understand what I'm saying but there's things that I won't do. Our promise when we became Christians was that we would work for God and for his plans and for his goodness and for his kingdom, that we would show um, honor and respect to him and to his ways, to his family, to his people, to his messengers. And if we're not willing to do that, we shouldn't be surprised if some of our answers hit the ceiling and don't seem to go any further. Sometimes God's answer to a prayer is, get up, go, do what I've told you to do. Trust that I will take care of you. Here's one of the ways that I put it. I believe it's a warning that we should take to heart. God will go with you unless you reject his word and his ways. If you rebel, you're on your own, no matter how much you worship or pray. Listen, if God's children are too rebellious, God lifts his hands and says, try it your way, see if you like it. 
but there's a warning. God doesn't promise to go with us anywhere. Can God do anything? Yes. Will God do anything? No. Why God gives us the authority? Why God gives us the say-so? Why he doesn't smack us around and force us to do things his way? I don't understand. If I was God, I would not do things this way. But that's just it. I'm not God. His ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. And I can't really claim to understand and know what he's doing. And neither can you. But I do know this. God will go with you as long as you're obedient. God will go with you as long as you don't rebel. God will go with you. He'll protect you. He'll help you. He'll take chaos and make beauty. But you need to do your part, and I need to do my part, and we need to remember who we are and who we're not.